Okay, all right. Hi, everyone. Uh, Elin, can you let me know whether you can hear me well? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, Yong right, can right. hear you well. All right, thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, our MNS Auto Workshop. Uh, yeah, so I hope everyone is fine and stay safe. So um, let me just briefly go through our program for the day. So uh, we will have three speakers today. And of course, we are very, we are very grateful that we have uh, Prof. Ahmad as our moderator today uh, to moderate the session. So, so as you can see, just a moment. Uh, Eileen, can you uh, enlarge the screen? Just a moment, and let's wait Elin to enlarge the screen. Is this okay, y'all? Uh, you haven't put in the enlarged slide. It's yes, show. Hmm. Okay. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, so this is the program for the day uh, for our MNS Auto Workshop. So uh, we will start off later at 9 a.m. We will have Prof. Ahmad to have do our opening speech. And at 9.31, and we will have our first speaker from the Malaysia Auto Network, Annabelle, to talk about auto and oil pump plantations. And uh, so each presentation will be uh, 20 minutes and each presentation will end with a Q&A session. So please, uh, Ask your question after each presentation, but no worries. If you have the question for the previous uh, presenter, you can always type in, and we will actually we can actually uh, get back to the to your question if there are times allowed. Okay. So the the second speaker at ten a.m. is uh, our Juan Noraini uh, from Pelitan. So he will she will talk about uh, our Wildlife Conservation Act. And as the last speaker is myself from MNS, so I will present about our MNS Auto Project. Uh, and also, so uh, and also a short workshop section. This is what uh, what is it about? So this is uh, uh, the workshop section will be about filling out the the a form. So we have we have received tremendous amount of sightings, author sightings, uh, 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 around Malaysia, especially in in urban areas of KL and Selangor. So uh, we have come up with a form for everyone to actually. Uh, it, it's easier for people to fill it out. Uh, so because currently we are, I'm accepting from email, so so this is a form that you all will can download from MNS website, uh, and and we will we will we will email to all uh, MNS members through through email, and and you can fill it out and then you can send it to us. So we are at the baby step of actually uh, in 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 going with this. So uh, in the in the future we will we will improve it more. So after, after my presentation, we will have our closing ceremony and speech by Prof. Ahmad, and then we will have a group photo session. So, so this is the program of the day. Uh, so I will pass back the floor to, uh, to Prof. Ahmad for the uh, opening speech. So we are on time at 9 a.m. Uh, thank you, good morning. You see, you see my voice now? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, Wu Chiong. Um, and uh, the secretariat who organized this uh, meeting today. Uh, welcome all the participants uh, uh, to this uh, workshop. And then uh, we will discuss uh, uh, in detail on the conservation and protection of uh, otter. Actually, this uh, event is um, in conjunction with World Wetland Day, which we celebrated uh, celebrated uh, last week. Right? And uh, uh, I'm very sure you have uh, read some articles or news uh, related to World Wetland Day. Uh, since uh, many years ago, uh, MNS will never stop promoting 
all good events or popular events on nature every month. Eh? We have every month, sometimes every week. And this uh, month, uh, we focus on World Wetland Day, which is wetland is very important. Uh, it's part of the habitat of uh, our author. Uh, World Wetland Day, uh, this year theme is uh, water, wetland and water. So wetland and water, we cannot separate. And of course, with the climate change, uh, environmental destruction, deforestation and so on, reclamation of uh, wetland area uh, into another development. So this um, will create a lot of problem in the future for water resources, climate change, and other environmental effect. So education must be very aggressive. Uh, we need to uh, educate public, educate uh, peoples, especially in democratic country, we have to educate the voters. Uh, the voters must understand uh, the system of ecology and then understand about the importance of wetland and importance of water and clean water. We cannot be bullied by other people who can take advantage of this. For example, uh, water resources, when we have a problem with water, there is, there is an opportunity for business, but the suffer is the public. So the most important is uh, as an NGO, we are uh, working hard to make the public understand. I hope the participant today will be with us and bring more people to be together for the betterment of our environment, especially the wetland. So regarding to authors, uh, we have uh, uh, four species in Malaysia at the moment, and then we need to uh, protect them. And then some uh, one or two species are very sensitive. Uh, we have four species like Eurasian uh, otter, Lutra Lutra. This is another sensitive species. A small clock otter is a, uh, we can see it uh, in many places, but of course, because of habitat destruction, uh, water pollution and so on. So we have a problem or this uh, uh, species need to be uh, give more attention. Um, hairy nose water is another sensitive that uh, is endangered. We need to identify them. We have to look where are they and then try to protect. Uh, their habitats, you know, how to protect. This is what you need to understand. Uh, and we need, we need to learn about ecology. The most uh, uh, or, or urgent thing that we need to do is educating people. We don't have uh, a good research grant to support uh, research in this. We, need, we don't need many people are attracted, attracted to this field. So especially the young generation with the young gadgets now, with the new gadgets, uh, they don't see the real thing in life. So MNS uh, take this opportunity to bring people outside. And then now when we are talking about uh, getting more people into science, they only define science as just engineering and maybe the medical doctors as their career. But uh, more other things than that on about science, environments, biology and life and when we are talking about science and arts together we need to work harder to make people understand and not separating these two important things so maybe author actually can play roles in making this together not just to conserve and protect water but of course author will play roles in this uh, uh, in our environment they can be a, a indicator for this uh, uh, environmental quality. So uh, they, of course, they are in. They need clean water to live. They need a healthy fish to eat. So these two uh, uh, understanding about water, so we can see they really need a clean water. If they are there, we are living in healthy ecosystem. So this is what we need people to understand. So we need more money. We need more donors. We need more corporate sector to participate to highlight this. We would like to thank to Kuala Lumpur, uh, Dewan Menara Kuala Lumpur, who are interested in uh, do research and conservation, public education, and so on on author. I hope this uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur city will get a lot of support 
from private sectors and so on to uh, to be together with Malaysian Nature Society uh, and then uh, we can protect uh, otter in the city. So this is something that new that we have to do. And then in order to move forward on the otter conservation and protection, we have MON, Malaysian Otter Networking, um, which is a very important uh, to bring people together, not just uh, a researcher, but we need more interested people in conserving water and uh, uh, maintain the quality of the environment. So I hope uh, uh, by uh, uh, joining this uh, Malaysian uh, Otter Network, uh, we can bring uh, people together and then have networking with the international uh, author network, uh, sharing information, their experience. And I know in, in Europe, for example, they have been working this on author for a long time uh, when they have a problem with pesticides and other chemical pollutants in aquatic environment, author was uh, one of the uh, good indicator that can uh, help uh, people to uh, be aware on the pollution. So we can learn from their uh, their experience and then this kind of networking among the professional scientists, uh, corporate and uh, those who are interested in author, of course, I'm very sure we can uh, use MON, eh, MON, uh, Malaysian Author Network in it, as a task force or pressure group, pressure group to make sure our environment is clean and well maintained. So this is a uh, uh, something that we need to know in order to do that, we have to, to do more aggressive uh, MON, will be more aggressive. We have many members along all over the country, from Perlis to Sabah, and I hope uh, uh, we will unite together. Uh, at first, maybe we can identify the area where we can find uh, authors, and then later we do some training and so on to, to get more knowledge, sharing knowledge between the scientists and the non-scientists. So by having this, uh, we understand better and then we use our facilities and networking to educate public through SEPA program, uh, communication, uh, education and public awareness. Public awareness is very important because these are the people who really uh, 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 become a pressure group, you know, to to make sure everything done. If we don't have uh, knowledge, we don't have awareness, we just look at uh, what's happening in, in our environment, habitat destruction, and, and so on. We have uh, nearly 500 schools that joining our KPA, Kelab Pencipta Alam. So this uh, also can be our uh, agent, our networking to go to the ground, educate, educate public what is author, I hope. Uh, where uh, public sectors, uh, corporate sectors can join us together to support this because the education is very important, not just for protecting and conservation, but educating people in science. Uh, if we know that now uh, science education is in demand, but Malaysia is still left behind. Maybe through this uh, activity, uh, we attract them to think to think uh, about the environment, to think about the solution, and then attract them to do uh, more research or go into science, uh, then they can help us uh, in uh, conserving uh, wildlife and environment. Not just a biologists or ecologists, but the engineers actually they can help a lot on the conservation because they are uh, planning something, uh, building and, and develop uh, but sometimes when we don't have the uh, information on ecology, understanding about behavior of animal, you always uh, design or develop something that might against the uh, conservation purposes. So I think uh, with that uh, short notes, uh, I hope all the participants uh, are aware and together with us, Malaysia Nature Society, uh, work hard for the conservation of wildlife, conservation of habitat. We're not against the development but we want them to develop accordingly so that we can protect the animals. All right, 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the secretary for giving me this opportunity. Thank you for the support uh, from, the, from, the, from the participants. I hope uh, this is not just a ceremonial, but we all are moving forward and working hard together with Malaysian Society. Please uh, visit MNS, www.mns.my and then join a member and support our activity. As the all, uh, oldest nature-based society in uh, Malaysia, we just celebrated uh, 80th anniversary, and I'm sure you want to be with us so as an oldest uh, nature-based society in Malaysia and be proud of it. And this is our society, this is our nature, this is our country. So thank you very much. Maybe we can proceed with this uh, uh, forum. Uh, Yong, which yep. Yong? Can yep. we, we proceed or you want to say something? Yeah, hi, Prof. Yeah, so I just want to uh, add on uh, add on one point is uh, so our MNS Auto project, uh, which I will actually later explain also, we established in 2019, but we haven't able to actually uh, start uh, kick starting the um, the 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 project uh, due to funding. But uh, we are very fortunate to uh, and and express our highest gratitude to actually uh, to MSIG uh, Holdings Asia, uh, MSIG Asia Holding for actually to become our first funder and to support our project. Um, and together with Conservation International Asia Pacific also, because we have a partnership um, with, with, with uh, CIAP and, 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 and both of uh, this agency and, and, and party, they are very supportive to our other project, especially into the protection of mangrove and, uh, and protect the nature across the Asia Pacific region. So uh, here, MNS uh, would like to express our gra uh, highest gratitude to MSIG Asia Holding and also Conservation International uh, Asia Pacific. Yeah. So uh, Prof, I think uh, you can continue for the first speaker, Annabelle. And, and yeah. Okay, uh, we will to invite uh, the first speaker, Annabelle Timothy Pezin. Uh, she is uh, graduated from University of Malaysia Sabah and then conducted uh, research in auto and stream. Uh, this is important, eh? and stream near the uh, oil palm plantation uh, because now uh, maybe the, we don't have a previous uh, knowledge on the ecology, uh, some or many uh, oil palm were right at the river or at the coastline. So we don't have the good enough buffer zone to protect it. So I think uh, I don't want to elaborate further. Maybe uh, Annabelle will explain to us more about it. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Sir Annabelle to uh, present a presentation. Annabelle? Hi, sorry, I'm having a technical problem. Right now, can you can you present or we can do it later? Uh, I'm having uh, not right now. I have to restart my laptop. Okay, uh, so now we 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 go to the next speaker, right? So in that case, we go to the next speaker. Uh, we 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 will invite. Uh, uh, Noraini Nasruddin from uh, Wildlife Department, Division of Enforcement, uh, to tell us about rules and regulation about wildlife, and then uh, telling us about uh, enforcement activities, because this is very important. Number one, uh, public need to know the rules and regulation. Uh, then they will have a parliament and authority to support the, 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 the enforcement of the rules and regulation. Uh, the second one, uh, they know what uh, Pralitan is doing, at least uh, as we see in, in case something happen, people like to blame the Pralitan uh, not doing their job. So let uh, Narani explain uh, what is the rules and regulation, what is uh, uh, Pralitan are doing, and then what we need from public to support 
support uh, our wildlife, uh, to protect our wildlife and preserve or conserve our wildlife. As what I mentioned earlier, this is our nature, this is our country, and we need to protect together, not just depending on uh, one person. So let me share with Norani Nasruddin. Norani, you ready? Yes. <clears throat> yes, Prof. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 thank you, Prof. For uh, okay. Thank you, for Prof, for a brief introduction. So, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning to everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, MNS for host this uh, workshop. This, uh, so, uh, today, this morning, I would like to present, to share a little bit about uh, what uh, uh, wildlife in Malaysia because the time is 20 minutes, so I try to cram everything in 20 minutes. So today I'm going to talk wildlife in okay, Malaysia. Okay, take your time. Yeah. Oh, okay, because yeah. we are we are ahead. We have earlier. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, what I'm going to share with all of, you, all of you today is about laws and conservation. Not specifically go detail on authors, but uh, a little bit general about the wildlife in Malaysia and the, uh, its uh, laws. Okay. Uh, my slide today, I will talk about first uh, overview on wildlife laws in Malaysia, then uh, what types of wildlife crimes, data and statistics, and then uh, we will touch a little bit on authors, plantation versus wildlife conservation, what's happened there, what's going on, what to do, and the challenges. Okay, uh, for the starting is, uh, we know that we have uh, West Malaysia and East Malaysia. So uh, for you all, for your information, that uh, Peninsula Malaysia and uh, Malaysia part in Borneo Island, we have different legislation. So in Peninsula Malaysia, so the red one is for Peninsula Malaysia, which uh, Wildlife Conservation Act, Act uh, 716, that endorsed in uh, 2010. So uh, this act, we will uh, only can be used in Peninsula Malaysia and uh, Wilayah Persekutuan Labuan because it's under federal territory. Uh, for Sarawak, we have uh, Wildlife Protection Ordinance 1998. Uh, so uh, this ordinance is uh, legal in Sarawak only. And we have in Sabah, we have Wildlife Conservation Enactment 1997. So uh, this act is worked in Sabah. And another one we have the International Trade in Endangered Species Act 2008, Act 686. This one uh, is also known as CITES Act. This act being used all over the whole uh, the whole Malaysia, include Sabah Sarawak. So this act covers everything, flora and fauna is covers. But uh, the, at the below I show you is more on the uh, animals, wildlife, wild animals. Okay, so in acts in the acts that. Uh, we use in uh, Peninsula Malaysia is uh, X716, X686, and X226. So actually, uh, I haven't said previously, X226 is for uh, National Park, establishment of National Park. So I would like to uh, bring your attention to X716. So this X comprises uh, 136 section, and the highest fine is 500,000 ringgit Malaysia, and maximum five years in prison. That actually is uh, if mistaken, it's ten years in prison maximum. And uh, as uh, Prof said just now, 
there's uh, uh, four species of otters in Malaysia. And uh, for your information, all the otter species are totally protected. So uh, you cannot apply a license to keep it. If you want to keep otters, you need to apply for special permit. Which special permit uh, we uh, need uh, clearance for the minister, not the our DG. So it's very tedious. For time being, uh, perhilitan we never, uh, we haven't give any special permit to individual, to individuals, to keep uh, the authors. Actually, we have a special permit for like zoos and some uh, special permit for research for organization. Kind, yes, we do have, but for individ individual, we haven't uh, give any permit to have it. Okay, for Act 686, it's comprised of 50, uh, 55 section and fine up to 1 million and maximum 7 years in, pre uh, in prison. So this one is much more on uh, import and export. Uh, issues. Okay, what do we have on the the types of uh, wildlife crimes in Malaysia is being uh, we separate in few category. So actually, if we go, we can see in the plantation. I think there's eight categories, and I think seven of it will uh, come on uh, all are happening in uh, plantation. Firstly, is illegal hunting, smuggling. Some smuggling is not happen in the plantation, but people do uh, go to the plantation and get the wildlife over there. Sorry. Get the wildlife over there to smuggle it. Uh, to uh, another country. Trades, yeah, it's, it will be trades before to smuggle. And then people, how they to, uh, get the wildlife? Mostly, it's easiest way to put a snare, wire snare, but the impact is very terrible to the wildlife. Some of the cases when uh, our enforcement found uh, animals, the wildlife, which trapped to the, uh, to the wire snare. The situation is very bad. They got infected. Then we have some, uh, we have some elephant in our uh, elephant center in Kuala Ganda. There's, they cripple because of the wire snare. It's very small baby. The situation is so, the impact is very bad to the wildlife. And sometimes when the wildlife injured, they will be uh, <clears throat> violent, then uh, the wildlife will attack the, the people surrounding. So it's very bad situation. So uh, the fifth one is encroachment. So uh, actually we used to talk about uh, encroachment from the illegal uh, from immigrant to the uh, protected area. But I think in plantation, they do have encroachment where outside from the plantation, they go to the plantation to set a snare for uh, ayam hutan, galus-galus, and so on. People for hunting, so uh, sometimes the plantation, they do have the encroachment. So possession, so is uh, people po possess the wildlife, but uh, they didn't have a proper document or without uh, without uh, pro docu uh, without license or permit from the authority. This possession, if I uh, got, they will be uh, it will uh, go to the court. Okay. 
uh, licensing is uh, usually more on technical, like uh, the license expired and so on. But it's also happened. And last but not least, uh, zoos and exhibit. So there's a few cases uh, because the zoo need to register. They have to. Uh, we uh, the department will do some auditing to check the zoo to make sure the animal welfare over there is taking care, taking well off. So uh, there's a few cases with the zoo also. We uh, so we're going to see uh, what is going on on the authors. So this report is uh, posted by Traffic on uh, 2008. So uh, from here, we can see, uh, actually you can get the report online. So it's available to, uh, to download. Uh, actually from the report, it shows there's a small cloud author is very famous for, very famous for uh, being sell in the online. People, uh, it's easier, especially during this pandemic, COVID-19. So people are being at home. So there's nothing to do. They play with the handphone. And then the so, okay, there's a uh, wildlife or there's a trend nowadays. People keep wildlife for pets. So it uh, actually is not a good trend, but it's happening. Like, uh, so it's happened uh, all over uh, Southeast Asia. So we have, they have in Thailand, Indonesia, Japan, Vietnam, and so do Malaysia. We also get some of the report uh, on cyber, uh, cyber crime on these authors. Okay, before I go to the next slide, so uh, I want to show how much uh, how, how much the cases we got over over the years. So in uh, is from the graph from the st statistic you can see that uh, possession and licensing is uh, is the highest one actually is uh, okay uh, it is uh, most of the cases of the crime that the cases that we got is like uh, we have it on pet shop or at the house like uh, is uh, because it's easy. Uh, this one is more when the uh, when the individual be caught right-handed, so it's much more on possession. They keep uh, wildlife for pets, or they try to uh, make bait the uh, the wildlife. So actually this one for all over uh, Peninsula, Malaysia uh, and Wilayah Pesketuan Labuan. And then uh, possession, like uh, in 2020, we got up to uh, 1,060. This one uh, as uh, the cases that we recorded and we make uh, for uh, uh, the uh, investigation paper for to the our laws officer before we uh, bring it up to the court. Okay, uh, so uh, we can see illegal hunting. We can compare 2019 to 2020 is very high. Uh, there's increment from two to ten is because uh, what the trend we can see people are uh, that during MCO they 
they stay at home, so cannot go anywhere. There's nothing to do. So they go and hunt nearby. So, and then there's a smuggling. So uh, this, the case actually is uh, a little bit, the smuggling is when people transfer uh, through the borders. So it's quite low because if it's nothing to do with the borders, so it's, uh, we, we don't uh, count it as smuggling. So it's a typo, it's others. Others uh, related like, um, like zoos just now, like snare, uh, not snares, uh, like uh, torture the, uh, the wildlife and so on. So there's, um, there's a wildlife crime that uh, we recorded for five years. Uh, it's, I think it's very high, but uh, there's uh, some cases that we haven't got the information and they walk away like that. It's very sad to see, okay? So we can see for the authors. Uh, the authors, actually, uh, the cases we recorded is for five years, is seven cases. It, uh, eight individuals of author, life author that we save, but one is died uh, due to abusing. So most of them, is uh, we found that at home. So actually, as you know, because yeah, we have a, have a slot with uh, uh, about the uh, authors. Actually, authors is a social group. They're not living uh, individually, not solitary. They are grouping. So to get the uh, baby otters for the for a pet so you have to kill the parents you have to kill most of the group because they are territorial and social uh, wild animals so you have to kill that to kill the other group the other member of the group to get the baby so uh, to get one uh, to get one of the baby otters as a pet, I think you have the that individual have to kill others of the members. So it's very sad to have like that. Uh, as I said just now, otters is uh, totally protected. So actually, uh, the fine for the authors is up to 300,000 and or 10 years in prison or both. So uh, actually for 300,000, this one is for, uh, for female, uh, female adult uh, authors. If you get caught with it, it's you will be fined up to 300,000. So um, there's uh, for this case, seven suspect, suspect are arrested and all in suspect's house, but one in the restaurant. And mostly the authors being promoted as pet through online. Okay, uh, actually, uh, per, uh, perhilitan we do monitor all this uh, online cybercrime, but yeah, we do uh, monitor and we keep our eyes on this all cybercrime. Uh, we are in middle of try to amend our act uh, to have a 
to have a better prosecution in the cyber crime case. Hopefully, we can uh, amend to the we can uh, get uh, endorsement approval from the parliament after we finish our emergency uh, end of this year. Okay, so we are talking about plantation versus conservation. So what is what what is supposed to be? So actually, in plantation, sadly is a food bank for most of most of wildlife because uh, if you can see there's a, uh, what they call uh, spotlight night night tracking whatsoever for the ecotourism they will go next to the plantation to uh, get a, with a flashlight to find a nocturnal wildlife. So actually, uh, a lot of species that stay and find a food in the plantation. It's a wildlife refugee and habitat. When there's, uh, because in plantation, there's not, not, uh, not heavy traffic with human. Sometimes there, when people go to the plantation and they come back to their home, so the wildlife will come and try to get uh, like uh, oil palm fruits to get the new shoots uh, on the forest floor. There's some of the insects on the forest floor. So uh, wildlife love to go there. Okay. So, uh, in plantation, if people would like to keep the wildlife, you, uh, I would like to remind, uh, you need to apply a license, but the license only available for, um, for Schedule 1 in um, our Act uh, for protected, but for authors, only special permit because it's lies under uh, schedule two which are totally protected so we have um, different category so actually wildlife is a, a biological control you can see in plantation there's a lot uh, they are using owl to excuse me they are using owl to uh, catch uh, mice and snakes in the plantation. So wildlife also can be a biological control. And balancing ecosystem which wildlife as uh, uh, seed spreader and uh, for plants, for fruits, they're helping to fertilize all those, the, the dung being fertilized for the ground. So actually they have a very good impact to the environment and ecosystem. So that is the pro part. What is the con? What is the negative part of the plantation? So sadly is prone to hunters and collectors because it's easy because uh, the plantation is easy to access, especially, sorry to say, especially the one who work inside the plantation. It's just your back home. So you easy to go and collect and hunt the wildlife. Uh, that is the negative part. And it, it's uh, less patrolling and enforcement. So actually, uh, our from Pilitan, sad to say we are not going. Uh, Peninsula Malaysia is very big. It's very big land, big area. So we, we do not have uh, our strength, our, our staff to go every inch of uh, the area to do patrolling and enforcement. 
but yes we do our best to catch the all the culprit of those who uh, keep enhance the wildlife and sadly also in plantation there are lack of knowledge and awareness because they said behind of my house at the quarters every day i saw otters they are coming and then i saw birds so on so the thing is good to keep it but yeah is uh, against the law another is ignorance mostly we can see not mostly some some uh, in Malaysia, Malaysian citizens, they don't care. Yes, uh, I think, I think uh, mo most of people are care. We, the one who joined the, uh, the workshop is the one who care. But certain in the remote area, inside in the plantation, there's no line, no whatsoever. They're, they do not know and yet, yeah, I can see this can kind of ignorance. So actually it's far from public, it's secluded. The plantation is just have a, uh, like rubber tree, oil palm tree, that's all they have. So not, not, it's very far from public, secluded, far from the enforcement officer and so on. So actually uh, we have, we need to find uh, point to balance all this because like uh, Prof Ahmad said just now that MNS are trying their best to do about the auto conservation actually we do uh, we do uh, love people who like to join the to do the conservation because uh, in conservation part not only perhitan or government, but as public NGOs, there's a is a good help, big help for us. So, uh, I think this one is my last slide. So, what is the the challenges? Is to yeah, how to see the relevance to plantation comply with the law and the monitoring the survival of the species. Actually. Uh, not only perhilitan or government agency, but actually it, it need integrated responsibilities among various NGC, plantation top management, the workers, NGOs. It can support because it's, uh, it's like uh, uh, end of last year, we have a big flood. So yes, government did do their uh, job, but there's other agency also, other uh, private sector also help. So do these uh, issues because conservation of wildlife is uh, also um, important. And then, uh, as you know, uh, most of the plantation they uh, have signage on no hunting zone, no hunting zone. So it need to enforce, it need to uh, tighten the, uh, the, the uh, order. Okay, and then uh, the plantation or anybody can put some signages and posters to remind to the resident or in the, uh, in the plantation, uh, uh, not to keep the wildlife. If you like to have for some certain birds, yeah, you can apply a license to the Pilitan office. During roll call every morning, reminded, remind to all staff and labor, the labors every day not to hunt or keep wildlife or eat it. Yeah, it's very sad. Routine check, checking is uh, from the plantation from the for the plantation is good uh, have checking uh, probably from police one to one to make sure because if uh, we have a case inside the plantation 
sometimes it will uh, effect to the owner of the plantation also. So uh, others is mitigation in house wildlife enforcement team is from the uh, is from the plantation to prevent and reduce the crime. And last but last but not least, uh, report the wildlife crime to the authority. So is either to have a compound or court case, but in case for the authors, they will no compound. It's just direct to court case because it's a totally protected. Yeah, I've been one. I think that's all. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nani. I I I hope uh, the participant understand better about the rules and regulation and the. Uh, uh, function. There uh, are many questions, but uh, I will ask you uh, only one question. How far uh, is otter usually uh, disturbing this uh, fish pond, for example? Uh, because we have uh, a lot of problem from fishermen, uh, fish pond operators, for example, now during migratory bird, and then uh, author uh, disturbing their point. Is there any, any case uh, uh, that you are uh, uh, that reported to you or any uh, advice that you give them regularly? Because I'm very sure all the fish pond operators has registered with Majus Daira at least or whatever authorities. And, and I, I know that Perlitan always left out in this, uh, so how far are you monitoring this fish pond and conflict with authors? Okay, uh, thank you, Prof, for the question. Regarding to the fish pond, I think it's mostly being reported in Temelo for Ikan Patin fish pond. There's few cases being reported. So actually, uh, because uh, generally, as I think everybody known that we only have four species of otters in Malaysia and uh, some of it is uh, very to totally endangered. So the numbers is keep uh, reduce, decrease due to uh, due, due to of lack of the habitat. But actually is what, what, what we can say uh, what I can say is, Actually, we when we got a report from the uh, the pond owner, so is uh, we try to advise them to mitigate it because actually is uh, the fish pond owner is really near the river, is their their habitat, so the owner need to co to monitor and secure the, uh, the, the fish pond. Because uh, actually uh, we won't uh, take it down. I mean the otter, because it's their habitat and sometimes it's a seasonal. But we can say like you have, uh, when there's a food, easy food, they keep going there. So it's something like, like what we have a uh, uh, elephant conflict they go they, the elephant go to plantation so we ask the plantation to give way some some of the area for elephant to feed on so it's something okay. that we can do win win situation yeah. some of right. some for the otters and it's like zakat lah kut yeah, but not not many people. All you must remember, uh, the business people want maximum profit. So I think we need to educate them. We need to do something that we can solve this problem. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Panarani. Yes. Uh, I will uh, uh, come back later to you. Uh, we have many questions because uh, I can, I can see the public are very interested in uh, wildlife department and wildlife in nature. Uh, but uh, for one more information, uh, maybe uh, Perlitan website need to be more friendly 
on this uh, uh, for the public to refer, especially on the endangered species and the protected species. So that uh, meaning that put in the front, in the front page, uh, so that easy to click. All right. For the next uh, speaker, I would like to invite uh, Annabelle. You ready now? Yes, I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. We'd like to uh, invite Annabelle to present her presentation. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to um, apologize for the technical problem earlier. Uh, thank you for inv inviting me as a speaker for the workshop today. I would like to greet everyone a very good morning. Um, I'm Anna. I'm Annabelle Pianzin from University of Malaysia Sabah and also representing the Malaysia Auto Network. Today, I will be speaking about my research project, which highlights the importance of riparian reserve for auto conservation in all palm domina dominated landscape. Uh, next. First of all, I would like to um, talk about some background information. Um, the conversion of forested habitats into agricultural sites is a major conservation concern. Next. Uh, next. Um, both Malaysia and Indonesia are the world's highest palm oil producer with more than 80%. They are also the largest holder of Southeast Asia's residual forest. While the conservation of primary and secondary forests should be prioritized, directing protection on them alone is not enough. This is because the land devoted to crops and livestock covers a greater area compared to reserves or habitat unchanged by humans. Uh, next. In order to combat the negative impacts of conversion, such as biodiversity loss, water pollution and soil erosion, the maintenance of native vegetation along water bodies within agricultural areas known as the riparian reserve has been established. Next. Under the Sabal water resource enactment, stream size with more than three meters is required to have a vegetation buffer size with a minimum of 20 meters, whereas streams more than five meters, a minimum of 30 meters. The main rationale for this is to prevent water quality degradation and damage to aquatic ecosystem. Next. Although the preservation of riparian reserve within all palm plantation has been adopted as a useful approach to mitigate biodiversity loss, enhance biodiversity resources and maintain useful ecosystem functions, it remains how, unclear how riparian reserve affect individual animal species such as the otters in the all palm landscape whether these reserves are able to serve as functional habitats such as foraging and refuge sites for otters. Uh, next. Out of the 30 species of otters worldwide, four of them occur in Malaysia. All four species are also residents to Sabah. Um, there are three endemic species to the Asian region. Uh, next. Uh, sorry, uh, previous again. Uh, this, the auto with the star sign is the endemic species to the, to, the, uh, to the Asian region, which are protected under the Sabah Wildlife Enactment 1997 under Schedule 2 Part 1, where hunting and collection are allowed under license. Uh, next. There are three main research objectives. The first one is to determine the species and distribution of otter. The second is to identify the occupancy of otters in different land use changes. In this case is continuous log forest, heavily degraded forest, riparian reserve within all palm plantation and all palm plantation without buffer zone. And the third one is to investigate 
the microhabitat structure in all palm areas that are highly correlated to the presence of otters. Uh, next. The main research question for this study is to investigate whether the preservation of riparian buffers are able to support or minimize impacts of land use changes for otters and to identify the key habitat features that may influence the occurrence of otters in all palm dominated landscape. Uh, next. The study was conducted in Safe Project Kalabakan Sabah, located in the northern part of Borneo. The area is approximately 80,000 hectares of twice log lowland deep terrocop rainforests, Acacia and oil palm plantations established between 1998 and 2012. The Safe Project is also one of the largest ecological experiments in the world to investigate the effect of human activities through forest alteration on biodiversity and ecosystem function. The area which is um, bolded in black is the experimental area, which has been gazetted for the conversion of plantation in the last 20 years. Uh, next. Overall, there were 18 streams surveyed across four habitat treatments. The first one is continuous log forest in three streams. Um, the upper part of the forest has been logged in the 1970s and late 1990s to early 2000s, where 71% of the forest cover remained intact. The area is also connected to a large forested area with more than 1 million hectare, encompassing three large conservation areas, the Danum Valley Conservation Area, Malia Basin Conservation Area, and Imba Canyon Conservation Area. The three conservation areas have never been logged before. Next. For the lower part of the forest, the area has been logged in the 1970s and 1990s, around the ages for the construction of roads. 61% of the forest cover remain intact. Uh, next. For the next part of the habitat type, which is heavily degraded forest in five stream, next. Uh, multiple round of selective logging was conducted in the 1970s, 1990s to 2000, and all commercially valuable trees were salvage logged between 2013 to 2016. Next. The next habitat type is the riparian reserve within all palm plantation, which is the buffer zone in eight streams. Next. The area in white is all opal plantations established in 1998 to 2012. Uh, next. And lastly is open plantation without any buffer zone, two streams. Uh, next. The data collection was conducted between February 2017 to August 2018. Uh, next. Oh. There were two parts of the survey. The first one is visual science survey, where the main signs observed were water tracks and sprains, and whenever possible, direct observation. Two subtransacts of 500 meter in length uh, was uh, constructed, constructed along the riparian area, which was separated by a one kilometer gap. Each of the subtransacts was further divided by a 100 meter replicates. Overall, 36 subtransacts across 18 streams was used, and the occupancy survey was replicated four times. For the next part, which is the habitat characterization, physical habitat variables were recorded at 100 meter interval. Stream and vegetation variable documented such as altitude, forest quality, uh, shoreline substrate and canopy cover, as well as disturbance history such as distance to human settlement and estate and disturbance history of the area. Uh, next slide.
to analyze the data for auto distribution, coordinates of signs were saved in a handheld GPS and was used to create a distribution map. For auto occupancy, the modeling approach based on McKenzie et al. using the statistical software RStudio. Further analysis was conducted to investigate the relationship between microhabitat structure and auto presence by species. Uh, next. Uh, next, I will explain about the result, research results. Uh, next. For the first part, which is to determine the species of otter, there were two species of otters detected, the smooth coated otter and the small coated otter, which is also the common species in Malaysia. Uh, next. A total of 87 otter signs were found in 13 out of the 18 streams surveyed. Uh, next. Uh, for otter signs by habitat type, uh, Raparian had the Raparian Reserve had the highest signs, 49, with an average of 3.06 per 500 meters subtransact, followed by heavily degraded forest, 23 average of 2.03, open plantation without buffer zone, 8 signs average of 2, and continuous log forest, 7 signs with an average of 1.17. Uh, next. For the distribution of water, uh, next. Uh, small pot otter was found in all habitat types. In 17 of the 36 subtransacts surveyed consisting of 11 streams, uh, next. For smooth coated otter, they were found in all habitat types except for continuous log forest. In 13 out of the 36 subtransacts surveyed, consisting of nine streams. Uh, next. Uh, the following is the, the result for objective two, which is to identify the occupancy of otters, which shows that the occupancy of otter varied across land use types in human modified landscapes. For Asian small cloud otter, the highest occupancy was in riparian reserve with 0 0.86, followed by continuous log forest 0 0.42, heavily degraded forest 0 0.38, and open plantation without any buffer zone 0 0.31. For smooth coated otter, the highest occupancy was found in riparian reserve and open plantation without any buffer zone 0 0.68, followed by heavily degraded forest 0 0.41. No other signs were found in uh, continuous forest for the species. Uh, next. Some of the reason why otter might be able to persevere in an all palm dominated landscape. The first one is because of the linear nature of their habitat, which permits them to travel over long distances to meet their daily demands in contrast to other mammals with similar body sizes. They also have core areas such as denning sites, foraging, grooming, and sprinting sites spread across multiple land use types due to certain habitat characteristics preferred. Areas with dense vegetation is important for hole placement. They prefer undisturbed and secluded area for their natal den. Areas lacking in canopy cover and sparse to no vegetation with availability to sand and rocks are important for basking, grooming, and sprinting sites. Since otters are not confined to a specific area, they have a wide home range and are able to move to other areas from agricultural sites to forests and vice versa. Uh, next. Due to the recent disturbance in heavily degraded forests, where all commercially valuable trees were salvage logged in 2013 and 2016, the quality of forests and streams were compromised. Therefore, otters might have prioritized reserves as habitat since the vegetation buffer and stream condition had enough time to recover following previous disturbances, which was during the establishment of open plantation. This allows trees to mature and the complexity of surrounding vegetation to be established, influencing higher otter occupancy in riparian reserve compared to heavily degraded forests. This vegetation provides ample denning site 
protection against predator and prey crop removal from disturbance. According to Look at Al, the influence of selective logging is still evident in stream environment. Even after 10 to 15 years following logging, when log forest were compared to old growth forest, streams in the confrontation maintain more natural stream conditions compared to streams without buffer, displaying the value of preserving and restoring riparian buffers for the management of fresh water in these catchments. Although it is not enough to fully protect streams from the impact of all palm agriculture. Uh, next. Uh, sorry, previously, <laughs> previous one. Uh, next is that there are ample prey items in the streams from the detection of many sprains and visual observation. Uh, according to law, laws in 2016, the author analyzed macroinvertebrate abundance and found that it was correlated to the disturbance history of the surrounding landscape, which found that prey abundance was lower across all heavily degraded forest streams and was likely a limiting factor to the author presence there. Wilkinson et al. Um, conducted an extensive study on freshwater fishes, discovered that 28 species of fishes were present in and around the safe project area, where up to 25 are known to as focal food items to humans. Uh, primary forest had uh, 10 species, log forest 13 species, heavily degraded forest 17 species, all palm plantation with riparian reserve 22 species, and all palm plantation without riparian reserve 15 species. The focal fishes to local communities had an unexpected resilience to severe disturbance from land use changes, as the area was observed to have a relatively high level of species richness. The open plantation and some of the riparian reserve areas are subjected to uh, high water pollution from all palm effluent, rubbish from human settlements, oil spills, and etc. Uh, next one. Uh, previous one. Uh, Next is that uh, because of the distance between reserves and all palm plantations, which suggests that higher occupancy in agricultural sites might be possible due to suitable habitat availability in riparian reserve, which had their vegetation re restored after previous all palm establishment. With enough undergrowth vegetation, um, all palm plantation without any buffer zone are able to serve as a corridor to travel between um, good quality riparian reserves. Another reason why waters um, might be higher in agricultural site compared to forested area, which is also a limitation, is because of the type of substrate and stream topography, which influence the detection of signs. Since agricultural sites uh, are easier to traverse um, compared to forest, and also they have higher sandy substrate, which uh, makes identification of signs uh, easier. Because of this, there is a need to use advanced tools such as eDNA, camera trapping, radio telemetry, and et cetera. Uh, next. Uh, for the third objective, which is to identify characteristics of riparian areas correlated to author presence. For Asian small plot author, the model uh, retained three important habitat variables. Uh, next. The first one is altitude, which was positively correlated to the author presence. Although Asian small plot author was found in all land use types, only this species was found to reside in smaller hilly rocky streams located at higher altitude. The main reason for this is the type of main prey species they can consume, which is the which can be found in rocky subsection. Uh, next. Uh, for the next part, which is the proportion of bank with soil, which had a positive correlation to author presence. 
water rate detection was higher when there are higher proportion of exposed soil. Soil, especially sandy substrate, is known to be an important habitat feature of the otter habitat, as it is associated with grooming activity and an important substrate for sprinting sites. Uh, next. The distance between streams and human settlements had a negative correlation. This indicates that uh, Asian smallpox otter are highly adaptable and can tolerate moderate to high level disturbances. As otters need water as foraging and traveling sites, whereas humans tend to build human settlements nearby water resources for their daily needs, both of them will inevitably share the same space. This may cause conflicts to arise when they compete for food resources, as they are known to as pests to fishermen and pawn owners. And as a result, they are susceptible to being killed. However, they are usually they usually avoid human by coming out when there are fewer disturbances. Uh, next. For smooth coated otter, the model retained four important habitat variables. Stream width and depth has are significant variables and had a positive correlation. Whereas the two other non-significant variables that were included into the final model were number of trees and bank undergrowth cover. Smooth coated otters usually inhabit medium to large water bodies containing fish, high fish productivity and tend to hunt for larger prey compared to other otter species sharing the same habitat. Uh, wider streams were mainly situated in riparian reserve and heavily degraded forest, located at low to moderate altitudes where fishes are plentiful. Stream depth showed a positive correlation when mostly were found in riparian reserve compared to other land use types. Although the streams in reserves were not deep enough to hinder water hunting session. Uh, deeper streams usually contain a high congregation of prey items. Even though the number of trees and bank undergrowth cover were not significant, they are vital features of an otter habitat as they act as a buffer to disturbances, contribute to bankside diversity, and protection against predator. Uh, next. Uh, next. Uh, next again. In conclusion, the, com the two common otter species are able to survive in an all farm dom dominated landscapes. The results suggest that agricultural sites with a combination between riparian reserves are potential functional habitats for otter as for foraging and refuge sites, which has been underestimated in the past. By retaining riparian buffer strip, it was a successful strategy in limiting negative impacts of agriculture on freshwater ecosystem. However, it should not replace continuous forested habitats as they lack vegetation communities and are susceptible to extreme fluctuation in abiotic variables such as higher diurnal temperature and lower humidity. Uh, next. That is all for my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Annabelle. Very interesting, good, uh, good work, and more systematic. And uh, hopefully, uh, uh, from your result, we can suggest. Please write quickly. Send to MNS MNJ uh, so that we can. Uh, highlight it, this finding uh, to guide the uh, plantation operators, uh, government departments, and uh, public awareness. Uh, MNS actually is very important, NGO. Everywhere in the world, NGO play roles because the members uh, uh, among the wide range of professional, I like the activists. I like those who are really interested in nature because they can 
uh, work better, they want to learn more. You see from the question, I can see a lot of questions from the activists, those who are interested in uh, to know more on my life. So thanks to the participants, I hope we will be together. Uh, I'm trying to locate what is the best uh, uh, question to ask Annabelle, um, because you have uh, given us very good uh, proposal or ideas on the on the riparian, on the buffer zone, and so on. So the the question may be uh, how uh, public or the planters or the government are aware on the buffer zone because this is something that uh, need to be addressed and educate them. Annabel, uh, for um, uh, Sabah State. Mm -hmm. uh, the preservation of um, buffer zone is usually mandatory according to the water resource enactment. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, like in my slide, um, the requirements for the buffer zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, uh, sorry, uh, but, can but I? How far? Okay, I know the enactment, the rules, regulation is there, and your suggestion is good. How far the planters, the public, and the government are aware, government officers are aware on, on this matter, and how uh, this one was uh, is enforced. Because uh, we know already, uh, poison is very important as a filter, as a habitat. Uh, you know, the, the toxic chemical, the runoff, surface runoff will be filtered before they go to the river system. Uh, but the problem is the enforcement. So I want to know if from your uh, samplings, from your sampling site, from your journey to Talabakan, uh, that area uh, very far from, you are from Kota Kinabalu, right? Uh, oh, yeah. So you will see the, the how uh, government enforce the buffer zone rules and regulation and how the public respond to this uh, and the planters, how they, they, they preserve this. Uh, especially when uh, now, when we want to do logging, when we want to sell our uh, farm oil, for example, we need to have this kind of regulation. Auditing is gone through regularly. Uh, how far they respond to this buffer zone? Do, do you observe that? Uh, from my uh, sampling site, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, the preservation of a buffer zone is not really consistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some areas have buffer zone, some areas don't. Mm -hmm. So hopefully um, in the future, uh, the enforcement will be tightened. Or, uh, yes. will, yes, very okay, very so good I'll... answer. Uh, thank you very much, your answer. I want your paper to be published soon, your data. Uh, uh, actually, uh, I have um, submitted my uh, paper mm -hmm. to uh, author specialist group. Mm -hmm. So it so will be uh, published soon. <laughs> all right, well, we can share that because we can we can highlight your findings to the authority and, and let yeah. people know uh, on this. So thank you, Annabelle. Thank you very much. So yeah, our you, next Anna. speaker will be uh, Wu Ching Leong, uh, MNS uh, MNS uh, officer who uh, doing work on water. So he will highlight on his work uh, uh, on Forest Manager Park and others. Uh, maybe you highlight also our plan on the Kuala Lumpur uh, Auto Program uh, so that the public will know. And then uh, we, we want to, to bring Perlitan and uh, DBKL together uh, in this auto program. So I hope uh, uh, Wu Chiyong can explain more. So I, uh, he's done a lot of uh, research already and that we can share with him uh, for our knowledge and for or to support the conservation of water. Wu Chiyong, are you ready now? Yes, I am. So let okay. me share my okay, screen. Go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, just want to check everyone can hear my voice well. Yes, no problem. All right, okay, let me share my screen. Okay, so everyone can see my enlarged screen? Yeah. 
All right, thank you so much. All right, uh, yes, thank you so much for everyone still sticking to our workshop. Uh, we, we are ahead of time, a lot of time actually. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. We have over 100 participants registered over 200 and the one who attend has over 100. I'm very glad to see that number and so many people actually express the interest in auto conservation. Uh, thank you so much for the support. Of course, uh, yeah, I would like to uh, thank you again for our funder and partner, MSIG, and also Conservation International Asia Pacific uh, for the support of this project. So today I'm going to present two parts, uh, or I can say it's two elements in this presentation. The first one is we'll be uh, presenting the preliminary findings from this project that is funded by MSIG. And the second part is the workshop. So that workshop is a very short workshop, no need to be afraid or to be start the headache about. So this is not a, a, a workshop that will ask you to uh, contribute, but instead I will share uh, on what we can do on citizen science base and, uh, and the new things that MNS has uh, actually going forward to. Uh, and also um, is a, is a, is a kind of a how we want to engage more with the public in, in our conservation project. Okay, so yes, so today uh, I will present on MNS of the project, mainly focus on Kuala Selangor area. And I'm representative for MNS and also Malaysia of the network. So first of all, uh, for those uh, who uh, doesn't familiar with MNS, uh, Malaysian Nature Society, or known as Persatuan Pencinta Alam Malaysia, uh, we are the oldest environmental NGO in Malaysia. And we uh, are spread out to the whole Malaysia. So in, uh, because we have international participants here, so I think it would be good to uh, explain a bit more about Malaysia first. So Malaysia, we have two parts. We have Peninsula Malaysia, which is on the left side. If you can see my mouse moving, we have, this is Peninsula Malaysia, uh, as, or we call as West Malaysia. And this is the East Malaysia, or we call as the more, part of the Borneo Island. So we have Sabah and Sarawak, two large states. So, but uh, I think as explained uh, by Puan Noorani from Pelitan, uh, we have three different wildlife laws uh, that's been uh, practiced in whole Malaysia. Uh, so we have uh, Wildlife Conservation Act in Peninsula. We have Wildlife Prote uh, Protection Ordinance in Sarawak and Wildlife Conservation Enactment in Sabah. Okay, so three different acts that is, uh, 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 help us to advocacy of wildlife protection in whole Malaysia. But we have branches in whole Malaysia. So, but branches is run by volunteers. I'm from the secretary team, which is the HQ team. So we are also an uh, international partner for the IUCN member, BirdLife International and uh, Ramsa Focal Point. So uh, since 2019, we have established the MNS Author Project. So we have been the we have been a partner for IUCN uh, SSC Author Specialist Group uh, as part of their one group called NGO Friendly Author. And then we also work very closely with International Author Survival Fund since we start this project. So they actually uh, be very helpful and, and express a large interest in helping us to uh, steer forward the author conservation in Malaysia. Uh, so as I say, uh, two elements here today one is the findings from the project. The second one is a workshop. So uh, I could take a bit more time than the previous uh, both speakers. So uh, take a coffee, take a sip. Yeah, and, 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 and yeah. So just go through the speaker. So let's backtrack a bit on, uh, I want to explain like how this author research actually started in MNS. Because uh, as we know, in Malaysia, there's not much focus on what we call as um, less charismatic or charismatic challenge species. So this quite often are referred to the smaller size animal because they are not so attractive and not so uh, easily noticed by people. So unfortunately, otter is uh, one of them, although they are not small, I can say that. Uh, the, like, the largest species, smooth-coated otter, is, uh, is about from the nose until the tip of the tail, is about 120 to 130 centimeters. It's, as I, uh, I think I can say it's a medium-sized animal. So yes, so otter research actually start uh, at the beginning in the Kuala Selangor Nature Park, uh, because we conduct a camera trapping survey to see uh, what kind of mammals in the park for a uh, KSMP for Ramza, uh, uh, a biobits. So uh, the camera track actually capture the smooth coated otter species in the KSMP. So Kuala Selangor Nature Park is the first park managed by NGO in Malaysia, which is MNS. So MNS is managing KSMP on behalf of MDKS. So of course, uh, 
the usual resident of the park, which is known by a lot of public people who visit that place, is Smooth Coat Daughter. So I could show some video. So this is Smooth Coat Daughter. Let me just share my computer. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, this is uh, capturing the uh, Kuala Selangor Nature Park. So this is one of the behavior that they would like to do when they clean the fur. Because uh, we do have sea otter, okay? So as, uh, as we have mentioned, there are four otter species in Malaysia. We do have sea otter, although the otter has been seen in coastal region, but they always go back to brackish or freshwater ecosystem. So this is how they actually clean their fur after they hunt in the, in the saltwater environment. But our camel trapping also find out uh, another surprising find, uh, finding, which is the Asian small claw otter. Uh, we know that a uh, small claw otter is in the park, but we never actually uh, managed to catch a glimpse or document it. So uh, this could be the first time actually we had it on footage. So as you can see, small claw otter is the smallest otter species in the world. Uh, if compared to smooth coated otter, their body is very small in a group and less muscular and, and less uh, stockier body like the smooth coated otter. And, and like just now actually one of the others stand up, you can see the, the, the digit of the feet actually, the claw doesn't extend beyond the digit. That's why they have the name of claw, is small claw. So uh, there's something that we found that unusual because camera trap sometimes is a bit very difficult to identify other species. They are, lot, they are not like tiger, uh, has a different uh, body pattern stripe that can ID and, based on, uh, and ID up to the individual level. So otter doesn't have that characteristic that we can able to ID that and differentiate them in terms of species is a bit challenging also when we come to camera trapping. So here's one video. It's a very short, just a three second. Yeah, so uh, we thought that, okay, it's a smooth coat otter because it's a big size, it's not a small size. So we thought it's a smooth coat otter, uh, but I tried to uh, look into more details and I tried to play and stop, play and stop. So this is what we found that, um, so there's a white color lining. I'm not sure whether you can see it clearly from your site in the, in the, uh, from your laptop, but there's a white color lining uh, at the chin level and at the throat level. So for the hairy nose otter, it's very easy to distinguish from the other otter species based on the, the, the appearance is the white color lips, uh, chin and actually throat. Sometimes they will go on to the throat level. So if you see that, that is the hairy nose because uh, the best way to, to identify hairy nose is the nose part because the, this is, uh, it is uh, only otter species that has the hairy nose. Other otter species are like dogs and cat has a hairless renarium. Okay, so this is a hairy nose otter and we found that yes, the, uh, in fact, a hairy nose otter actually found in KSMP are uh, very surprising because this is a small area and it's a coastal region which um, which uh, we, we thought that hairy nose is only confined to swampy area. But we uh, looked at some published uh, published paper and also some history about hairy nose otter in Kuala Selangor. Uh, but we found something that can correlate to our sightings in KSMP. Uh, but I, I know it's a bit early, but be prepared for some unpleasant image that I'm going to show you. So this is one of the road queue uh, in, in, in Kuala Selangor. Okay, uh, actually this is a document uh, at the boundary of North Selangor Pit Swamp Forest. It's, it's quite near to Kuala Selangor Nature Park actually. So it, it, it identified as a hairy nose because of the radiant part and also the white color uh, distinguishable features. And of course, uh, in 2020 January, one of the local people actually called me up and they say they found an author that is unusual looking because they never see that author with that face feature before. They only seen smooth coated and Asian small claw. They say this is something that they haven't seen before. And I have mentioned to them before about this otter species. So they snapped the picture to me that is a road queue and also is a, uh, at the boundary of North Selangor Piswan Forest. So how we identify is, is, a, is, is a hairy nose because uh, you can see this is a white color, uh, chin and, uh, and the throat level and also of the hairy nose. So this is a hairy renarium part so we have uh, the latest information of uh, hairy nose otter in Kuala Selangor region, but sadly it's a road queue, of course. But now, so how we kickstart the MNS otter project and finally we are grateful that we are able to uh, start our research project with available funding. 
So uh, we start in August 2020 uh, until March 2021 for the for this current project. It's an eight months project. So there's two project elements here, um, which is uh, first is mangrove planting, uh, because this project will be focused on wetland. We are we are emphasizing on wetland conservation, but we are linking otter to wetland because uh, as we have seen the two previous presentation, uh, otter is a very uh, symbolic in terms of wetland conservation. Uh, together with all other wetland species like the water birds and firefly that we are doing. So now we are adding otter inside to actually strengthen the, the, the conservation of uh, wetland with mammals, birds and insects. So the second activity is which is our MNS otter project. So from this project, we are trying to get a first, uh, first uh, hand information, uh, very basic information like are there otters around Kuala Selangor coastline besides KSMP? Because what we know so far uh, is only uh, we have documentation of otters inside the Kuala Selangor Nature Park, but we have a go beyond out of the boundary of KSMP, which is a very long and uh, big, big, big area, a coastal area. But where are them? Where are these otter species if they are present outside of the Kuala Selangor Nature Park? Because along the whole coastline, which is called as the North Central Selangor Coast, KSMP is the only park uh, that is protected that is protected with the support from the government, MDKS. And how many species of them? So we know there are three species in KSMP, but how about the other area out of this uh, protected area? So of course, the, so the objective, we will, we will try to close the gap of eco eco ecological knowledge on coastal otter, and also try to generate awareness and capacity built on otter conservation among the local people and the public, like you all now uh, having this workshop. So the study site, it's the North Central Selangor Coast. Uh, so why we choose this site? Because uh, North Central Selangor Coast has been, uh, has been uh, 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 a study site that we MNS has been uh, studied for quite some time uh, through our Asian water bird census and also water birds project that we count uh, the water migratory water birds every year. Uh, so this is one of the site that is also identified as important bird and biodiversity area, IBA. And based on uh, BirdLife International, they recognize this IBA as an endangered IBA because a lot of uh, activities and development going on. And it's, all, it's, all, and it's also a very sensitive uh, ecosystem because it's a mangrove, but now it's a fragmented mangrove forest and a mixture of uh, a lot of different land use type. So when you zoom in, so the North Central Selangor Coast is uh, ranged from the top tip of uh, Selangor coastline which is Tabak Burnam, up until the Krang Island. But for this, uh, for currently for this project, we only focus on Kuala Selangor region. Uh, but we, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a funding coming in, so we will actually extend the study across the whole uh, coastline, which include Krang Island and Sabah Burnam. But of course, we still hope that uh, the MCO will improve so that we can uh, cross district uh, without uh, strict restriction. So this uh, whole range is range about uh, 100 and kilometer stretch. So this is our base, Kuala Selangor Nature Park. It's a mixture of uh, artificial tidal lagoon, mangrove forest, and also a secondary forest. So let's uh, focus on what we have uh, what we have done from from this project. So we are focusing on Kuala Selangor coastline. So what we focus is uh, from the Tanjung Karang area up until the Jaram area. So above here is the is considered as Abubanam, and below here is considered as a Kappa, which is under Klang region. So for this project, we surveyed uh, three transects. What first one is the Tanjung Karang site, which is 3.3 kilometer long. Another site is the Banja North site. This is a very interesting because this is a Banja North Forest Reserve, is uh, probably the largest uh, intact uh, mangrove forest reserve along the coastline, and it's a very important high tide roost for water bird. Uh, so this whole uh, transect we haven't we done any survey before. So this is the first uh, comprehensive survey that we have uh, conducted. Uh, it's a very long survey. Uh, it's a very long stretch, which is uh, 10 kilometers. And for the goes to the southern side, it's the Bagan Sungai Bulo, uh, which is uh, yeah, also range about 3.3 kilometers long. So we are looking at a, at, a, at a study site of a mangrove forest with oil palm plantation. So like I say, uh, it's a mixture of a lot of landscape. We have mangrove forest, we have, uh, you can see the box, uh, like a box of greenish. This is all the agriculture, mainly oil palm. 
uh, some coconut. And also, if you can see a white color, white uh, grayish color box, this is the aquaculture farm. Okay, and aquaculture farm also uh, actually is, is opposite of all the oil palm plantation as well. So basically, the whole coastline is, as, uh, is actually uh, kind of covered by oil palm plantation. So what we, uh, our survey method, so what we did is quite similar to uh, Annabelle. We use line transect to survey the author signs. We look at the signs because uh, authors are very distinguished. So they actually, they actually, uh, uh, they actually deposit sprains, what we call sprain, but it's also known as scats. That's, that, that sprain for scats, it actually has a very uh, fish odor that you actually can then distinguish for any other animal that you know that see it is an author. And you can see, uh, later I will show the picture, so you can see through the feces, you will know that it's author. But it's different kind of uh, content of the feces that, that is very interesting, that, that is an important study that we will going to conduct. Okay, so we do a science survey. So this is a coastal region, different from Annabelle. Annabelle is a kind of a inland area. So we walk on the bun. So at the left side of the picture, this is a walking bun. So the right side is a mangrove forest. The left side is uh, agriculture, which is plantation or coconut. So there are spec uh, there are transitions there are transition zone in between this uh, landscape, which is a uh, canal, and the bun. And another survey uh, survey tra line transect that we are going to do is inside the oil palm plantation. So we will ask the permission from the owner because all these plantation along the coastline are small holder. So we will approach them one by one. This might take a bit of effort to actually gain their trust, to explain to them uh, what we are doing, uh, what we try to actually achieve and, 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 and forge a collaboration between uh, with oil palm plantation people. And if they have given us the uh, permission, then only we go in and survey. Uh, if we do it without the owner permission, it's, it's consider, we are considered intruder. So that might cause a problem. Uh, so an addition to uh, 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 our study is we use camera trap. So we're able to install uh, a few camera traps along the Bagan Sungai Bulo transect and also the Banjar North uh, transect. So that's the uh, camera trap location that we actually put. So the, here is some preliminary findings. So first part is the distribution survey uh, of otter along the Kuala Selangor coastline. But we are only looking at latrine site, which is the sprinting site. So, but of course, at first, uh, we see otter. That's the, that's the, that's the, uh, um, uh, that's the every month uh, activities that we, that we have. We, 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 we conduct a survey every month, like uh, about 10 to 12 days uh, per month. So, uh, fortunately, every month we do see otters, but so far we only encounter smooth coated otter. Small crow are rather shy. They have a, they have a record or published. Uh, published data that they are actually more shy, elusive, and they are more inland, uh, inland, inland, inland kind of species. And they also uh, more to nocturnal behavior. Although some sightings are, uh, are actually diurnal in daylight. So here is a, one of the video that I show, uh, that I got. This in the uh, Bagan Sungai Bulo, uh, Sungai Bulo Sasaran. So this is a big group of otter that we have counted about 20 plus smooth coated otter species. So as you can see, this is the river. And on the right side is the mangrove forest. So mangrove is definitely, uh, 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 mangrove is definitely a vital habitat for the otters. They, they definitely like it. This is uh, one of the habitat they will actually uh, venture into because the river run around the mangrove lake is a, is a good place for fish breeding. So for smooth coated water, which they actually uh, prefer fish as diet, so they will always hunt there. Although this uh, river is always uh, a, a main transport for fishing boat, they seem to be not disturbed by the boat. And local community actually told me that they saw them eating ikan kembung. Mm. Ah. Mm. Ah. Mm. Ah. Mm. Ah. Mm. 
So, so a bit of story here is uh, actually local people told me that those times they actually saw about 60, 60 individual of author. But, but because of this uh, Sungai Bulo Sasaran, there's a case of uh, pollution which, uh, which have been badly affect the cocker uh, business. So they say after that, authors are, uh, has decreased uh, in very big amount. They haven't seen a very big group. And this 20 plus author uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a sign that they say authors are back. They, they say that they haven't seen that this big group before. So uh, that, that video is very long, so I tried to actually uh, trim it and actually uh, cut it into shorter video. So this second video uh, is showing that uh, this author actually going back into the mangrove habitat. It's about in the evening time. So another interesting thing is from the tight level, we could determine the present auto. So because local people say uh, when it's high tide or low tide, the orders doesn't appear. It's only appear in between low tide and high tide. And we also can see uh, a cup or, or sub adult of otter in the group. So this means that actually they are breeding, which is a good sign. Yeah, so that is the otters in mangrove area. So, so uh, how about actually the surrounding waterways? So many of you might wonder um, why we actually focus on oil palm plantation. Uh, because it's a wetland, most probably we think that wetland is to mangrove, uh, mangrove ecosystem, mangrove habitat. Uh, but why we are doing uh, oil palm? Because otter also uh, use the surrounding waterways that surround the oil, uh, the oil palm, the aquaculture, and like smooth coated otter has been uh, documented very adaptably to urban area uh, and also a uh, developed area. So we are trying to look at how this otter actually utilize the habitat of different land use type. Uh, so yes, of course, we, 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 we document their, their distribution through latrine, through science survey. And we kind of excited because we found that there are a lot of different uh, diet into this otter species. Adult latrine uh, uh, is not uh, very clearly able to tell us which species. Of course, when we look at scrap, we know as Asian small claw. But when we look at the other species, like the uh, fish, uh, like the here, like the fish, we doesn't know that whether is it smooth coated or herinose or Eurasian because three of them actually uh, is a big fish eater. Their main diet is mainly on fish. So small crawl, their main diet is mainly on crab, so that we can tell uh, there's a pre possibly pre presence of small crawl. So this is a very interesting uh, um, latrine site because uh, usually the latrine is either on the barn road or at the bank of the canal. But this is uh, at the Tanjung Kara site, they deposit the spring on the rock, big rock. So behind the rock is the mud flat and it's the sea, the, and it's the, it's the coastal area sea. So this uh, first um, uh, interesting latrine site that we encounter, which is uh, deposit on the rock, uh, actually across in Europe, the Eurasian order did uh, deposit uh, latrines uh, spray on the rock, but we won't say that this is a Eurasian order. Further, 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 further analysis that we, we, we need to do to confirm what kind of species is that. But so far we found that it's crab remains on the rock. So yeah, possibly it's Asian small claw. And also we found that uh, the east snake, so this is, not, uh, this is not a new thing to us, otter does eat snake. Uh, so these are, we found that there's a, a snake flesh uh, in, 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 uh, in one of the electric side together with all the fish bone and, and scales. And on the right is a prawn. They also do consume prawn. So they are, they are, they are very uh, generalists. They eat all kinds of uh, marine resources, but still they prefer fish the best. 
And for the left side here, interesting also, because we saw some fur inside. I'm not sure you can see clearly, sorry. Uh, so we can see some fur, little small fur here is a uh, small mammal, it's a type of small mammal fur. So otter also actually do consume small mammal like rodent, uh, all those, and also bird. So this also makes sure of, uh, of a pieces, which is fish scale and fur. So on the right side here is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, something mystery, still mystery to us because not only they deposit brain like this, they also deposit some kind of a jelly-like anal secretion. So there's been studied that uh, this kind of secretion actually is through their gut lining. Uh, this, this, this kind of mucus actually protecting um, the, the intestine from being, being hurt by the fish gill and, the, and bone. So they actually, when they deposit spray, they together they deposit the mucus out. And they found that this mucus could uh, generate a more effective uh, DNA analysis. So this is something that I've mentioned before, which is uh, for author to differentiate individual, like author A, B, C, or D, and species, we need to, the best is we need to do uh, fecal analysis through eDNA. That is because this kind of uh, genetic, this kind of species actually contain the DNA and genetic material of that particular order and the groups. And also we look at footprint to determine the order species. So for small claw, they are actually partially wet. They are not fully wet like the larger order species. So this is, we can say this is a small claw order. And for the fully wet one, we could say it's a larger order species. I can't say it's a smooth coat first because there could be possibly of a hairy nose and Eurasian, very unlikely, but we keep that in check. Okay, so, but we still say that it's a larger otter species first. So this is the distribution of the latrine sites of uh, our findings so far. So this is in the Sabagan Sungai Bulo. Um, one thing we found that, uh, which is, uh, we are quite surprising also because uh, we've seen smooth coated more than the Asian small claw otter based on direct observation. But it seems like more latrine sites are comprised of crab instead of fish. So there's something uh, interesting and, 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 and more study that needs to be conducted uh, on top of this uh, very basic uh, preliminary survey. So this is a Bagan Bulo site. So the love shape is where the, we capture the video of author in mangrove just now. So this uh, in the Tanjung Karang site. So as you can see here, we do have mangrove, we only have plantation. So we can't actually find any latrine site unless we go onto the mangrove area we saw a, a, a first latrine site along this transect. And also actually the rock, oh, sorry, not here, okay, here. Okay, so this is the Banja North site. So uh, yeah, it's overwhelmed when we go to survey this 10 kilometer stretch uh, Ban Road. So we, we walk along this 10 kilometer stretch. It's, 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 it's uh, amazing because every few, every more than five meters five, five, five meter that we walk, we always encounter latrine site on the barn road. So the, the, the bank, the canal bank is full of tall vegetation. It's a bit difficult for us to assess and there's a, some risk on that also because uh, the only risk that we are afraid of is snake and cobra and also mangrove snake. So for safety purpose, we only walk on the canal bank that is accessible. But most, most, uh, most of the time we are walking on the barn road. So it's, uh, mostly of the latrine inside are crab remains, but we found that there are fish. They are mixture of fish gill bones and crab, and they are also uh, they are also uh, with snake with snake or fur. Uh, and the and the one that with actually with the rock with the rock uh, spring site is around here, without mangrove. Yeah. So so but but we we can't say that we can't determine that this is the number of author group or number of uh, author individual, uh, or we can infer on the uh, author species distribution because this is based on just the latrine survey that we confirm there are authors in the area actively. And this is a one of the vital habitat, important habitat because uh, they deposit spray to signal territory. So we need to maintain this, uh, this, this whole stretch of transect in order for them to safely uh, come back to this site and, 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 and uh, make it as their home. We also found that one suspecting uh, hold, or we uh, actually call it a uh, nest, but in author, we call it hold. We suspect it's a hold because we heard some pup call, but we're not sure whether it's a dog or author. 
uh, because we don't want to go inside and disturb them also. Unfortunately, our, auto, our camera trap didn't actually capture any footage of any pub. But on, on, on other camera traps, actually we do capture pubs of Asian small crop. So yes, for, for Sungai Bulo side, we only document a uh, smooth coated otter for the time being based on our camera trap. And we also have some other species also that capture in our camera trap, like our wild boar friend. Uh, there's a lot of wild boar in, in, the, in the whole coast area. And we also have the, of course, the Nicobar crab eating maca is, is, uh, is, is, is all along the stretch you can see even in KSMP. And, and during our survey, they're always there to welcome us in the morning and evening as well. So, so but now they are classified as vulnerable before they are least concerned. And our camera trap also got water monitor lizard and uh, some bird species, munia, and also white-breasted water hen. So for Bar uh, Banjanov site, which is the, the site that we have a lot of, a um, uh, whole stretch of the, all the spring site. So we have two species. So this is, uh, this is how actually camera trap can help us in confirming the species on top of just looking at the latrine. But still the best is actually uh, through fecal analysis. Yeah, it's because there's uh, not, uh, that is um, that's the non-invasive method, although camera trap is considered as non-invasive method, but it's a bit challenging to put camera trap uh, in this coastal region, which I will explain later. So we have smooth coastal otter as shown on the left side, and we have also Asian small claw on the right side. So at, uh, this could actually have a pub that I didn't put in here because this is a clear picture that we have because we can see the claw, the, the digit of the, of the, of the, of the feet, I say it's a small claw. Yeah, so we have small claw and smooth coated. And also uh, we document other species. So far we have a common palm civet on the left and we have, we have also leopard cat on the right. Uh, but there are few pictures on this cat species that uh, I'm still uh, trying to identify because we are, we are cautious that uh, not to wrongly identify. Although that fishing cat is not documented in Peninsula Malaysia, uh, but uh, I will keep that in mind. Maybe that is some new finding that we can find. But uh, so far, what we have seen is a leopard cat. Yeah. So not only we do distribution survey, uh, looking at the latrine and also camera trap, we also actually talk to the local communities. Uh, how is our knowledge and perception on otter in oil palm plantation? So this is where we actually do interview survey and we approach the plantation owner uh, but, but due to MCO and COVID situation, uh, it's kind of uh, put an put a, put a, a, a obstacle to us to actually go and approach these people because uh, they are very cautious about, about outsiders coming and approaching them and also the COVID situation. Okay, so uh, here are some results that we actually uh, get from the local people. So they say that author doesn't inflict, inflict any conflict in oil palm plantation because they have no reason to come into oil palm plantation unless the owner have a fish pond. So one of the owner actually told us that uh, he has, he had a fish pond uh, in, the, in his oil palm plantation and about 30 individual of authors, uh, he say it's small crop because it's very small size. It's not the big size one. And come inside and, and one day, few hours, all the fish gone. Yeah, so he say, unless you have fish pond, if you don't, if you don't properly uh, manage it, your fish will gone. Uh, the, the, the author actually can smell and, and come over and, and, and say goodbye to your fish. Yeah, otherwise they say the, mostly they are seen in the canal uh, in between the plantation and mangrove and, and on the barn road. But they say it's very difficult to spot the author nowadays when compared to the past because uh, they say that the waterways around the housing area, around the plantation is not as clean anymore. Uh, they, they found that the fishes are getting lesser and sometimes they say they don't even have the fish anymore because these local people, they are, one, of their, one of their usual activities go fishing and it's just, they just fish around the canal and, and around the creek uh, in their housing area or in their village area. So they say they can't fish anymore because, because they say they can't find any fish. So they say that's why they, they don't see any otters nowadays and it's very, very difficult. So they say the only place to see otter is at the jetty, uh, which is just now we saw the otter video or, or at the coastal region of Bengal Forest. Yeah, so that's why, uh, that's why actually the local people here, they have a perception and appreciation of otter. 
because they told me one sentence. So as you see, this is a Malay. So they say, di mana ada memerah situ lah ada ikan. So in English means uh, where, where you can find the otters, that is where you can find the fish. So uh, in Malay, we, find, we will say rezeki. So you will find, uh, you will find a lot of uh, marine resources over there. So they say they won't actually kill, uh, they won't actually injure or hurt the otter because otter is an indicator species to them and it's kind of a signal for them where to find the fish. But also um, throughout this uh, few months project, we also try to document as much threats as we can uh, around oil palm plantation. Uh, so this is the second time I would, I would like to give a warning to you for unpleasant image. So um, what we do is a, is, a, is a study along the coastal region. Uh, but before we come to Kuala Selangor, we always take a road called Jalan Kuala Selangor, if we're from KL. So uh, along this uh, whole stretch of road is surrounded by oil palm plantation. Okay. It's surrounded by oil palm plantation. So in 2019, there's an otter root here. Uh, this is a smooth coated otter uh, document along this stretch of um, this stretch of road. And in 2020, last year, November, I did, uh, I also found that two otter species, uh, uh, sorry, two otter individual found at the road queue, uh, found as road queue also, uh, but it's different, different, different point along the road, okay? So uh, unfortunately, this one, the head is crushed. And when I found the carcass is already uh, bloated, it has been dyed for quite some time. So, Sadly, we are unable to identify the other species. Um, but for this, is a, this is not far from each other. So they most likely is a is a is a is a is a group, two of them. Uh, but this one is more like a smaller size, uh, uh, some kind of a sub adult, I would say. So probably it's a mother and a and a baby. Uh, not we can't confirm yet because the the carcass is really crushed, so we can't really identify. Uh, so this is the road that we can uh, that 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 where this. Uh, road kill found. So uh, the, a concrete has been built in between uh, the road for the left and the right. So along the plantation, there are waterways, there are creek or canal. So uh, most likely actually the otter, uh, actually the otter roam around the plantation area through this creek and, 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 and canal. Sometimes they do need to cross the boundary to, uh, to cross the, the road because uh, otter has a very large home range also. So for, for the smooth coated otter, there's been documented home range with a home range size of uh, 16 kilometer uh, 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 as a linear home range. Yeah, so in, in, in European side, Eurasian otter has been documented with uh, also about, if I'm not mistaken, 20 kilometer or more as a linear home range. So they, they, roam, a, they roam in a large area. So they might want to cross, but they found that there's a concrete there. So they might actually cross back and just hit by car. And another trend is also we found that in oil palm plantation, we often found that the, the canal and the creek in the plantation is clogged and, and, and uh, I wouldn't say it's polluted because I think uh, if we want to say the pollution, we need to do some chemical analysis to see what kind of pollute, polluting level in the, in, in the, in the, in the waterways inside oil palm plantation. Uh, but of course, plantation, uh, yeah, so, so they told us, of course, they use uh, pesticide uh, because uh, to kill the weed in order to prevent the snake. Uh, but, but this is something that we document along the project and we try to find ways to actually how we can actually engage with the uh, smallholders and also engage with the uh, authorities and on how we actually uh, make it a, a, happy, a, a habitat that can actually authors can roam around. So yes, challenges faced uh, from this project, of course, like I say, uh, camera traps is a challenge when we actually put up camera traps in uh, around coastal area because the whole coastal area is uh, urbanized area. Uh, uh, people uh, can just, just, just go around and walk on the bank road with motor or car. Uh, so this is one of the camera traps that we set up, but unfortunately someone actually uh, take it up and throw in the river. Okay, there's one also, there's one camera trap also been stolen. Uh, so this is the challenges face when we actually put our camera traps, when we are having, when we put our camera traps in an urbanized area. 
Um, so, so that's why uh, Ficker and Lysis come in very handy uh, when we do uh, auto survey. And most of the small otters are not staying around their plantation. So this is difficult in actually contacting them and engaging them. And of, quite often we only engage a few small otters that they are fortunate to stay in the plantation also. Yeah. So that's uh, basically the end of uh, presentation one or uh, element one of my pre uh, preliminary findings uh, on this pro project. So uh, now I proceed uh, to uh, the next section, uh, which is the workshop section. Uh, so this is a workshop section, which I would like to share. Just a moment. All right, so um, we did this to the local community also. So we are fortunate that we have local people actually now, the, the oil palm plantation owner that we approach, they express their interest in our otter conservation and they are willing to involve. So they're actually listening to our workshop now. So uh, this, 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 uh, this, this survey form also, we actually use it when we actually uh, talk to the local people and get more information. But we, but we transformed this survey form into a more public friendly because uh, like Prof Ahmad said, it's good to highlight also uh, on, 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 on one of the projects they are having on, which is the urban otter project. So we have received tremendous amount of otter sightings around the urban area of KL and Selangor. Uh, so so we, we, will, we, will, we will think that uh, coming up with this form, so that public people can actually uh, easily download this form or, or and you can actually jot down all the sightings, author sightings uh, if you have, and then you can contribute and send it back to us. So this is the workshop that we will go to contact is to actually explain this form very thoroughly uh, to everyone. Uh, yeah, so this is a sighting form and also a conflict, author human conflict form. So bear in mind, if you think that you have just sighting information, you still can use this form. There's one section that you can actually ignore, or if you have conflict, uh, animal conflict uh, issue, it will be a good form for you to actually fill it up, or you actually have friends who have this kind of information, uh, please do fill it up also. So basically we need uh, your name, not compulsory, you can put anonymous, okay? Uh, we need to know your sex and, and also your age, um, so education level is more on the local people. So not necessary, you have to fill in. And how long you have been staying around the area. Okay, so we want to see uh, how long you have to be staying and uh, correlate back to how, how frequent have you been cited the authors around your area. So this is the first part A, is the first basic information about yourself to let us know about you. And for part B is about your knowledge about the place where you have cited the author or the place that you have uh, experienced auto human conflict. So I uh, uh, appreciate if you can give us your address and also what kind of habitat that you have cited the author. Because not only we have uh, author sightings around the urban area, but we also have sightings of authors uh, in, in other parts of area like forests, uh, coastal areas, and, and, and yeah, all around Malaysia, which public people has been uh, very kind to actually contribute the information to MNS here. Yeah, because we, uh, we, are the only, we are the only NGO actually collecting this information uh, to, uh, with Pelita also. They are collecting the information on uh, author human conflict. So we are, we are actually, we are, we are want to assist Pelita to collect more information to get them more hand into this. So these are, these are, these are few uh, habitat that we list down. So feel free to let us know what kind of habitat that you cite the author. And for part C is how much you know about the because author is a bit hard to difficult to actually uh, identify uh, if you have sighted uh, just using by binaural uh, or just a glimpse. So, so with picture is easier that you can see all the marking, everything, all the, all the features. So we provide uh, pictures of each species for you to refer if you are in the field. Uh, hopefully it helps, yeah. And also description. Uh, this is a description that I try to compile and I try to um, uh, generate out to, for easier understanding for the local people and also for the public. And here's smooth code. 
and for small claw, it's more like a cat size species and it's more with a shorter tail, smaller head. Yeah. And for hairy nose, of course, like I said just now, is uh, because it's a distinctive feature of the white color lips uh, and throat. So here is the here's the marking. And also for Eurasian otter, uh, so for um, Eurasian otter is uh, is uh, is has not been sighted in Peninsula for very very long time. So we are still unsure whether is it still present or not in Malaysia. But fortunately, in Sabah, if I'm not mistaken, in twenties. Uh, I'm not sure which year, 2010 or 20, 2006, uh, there's an Eurasian author cited in, in, in Danum Valley, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so there's a distinguished feature with the description. So you can always refer back to the picture um, if, you, if, you, if you encounter any, any, uh, any author sightings. Uh, but if you're unsure, unfamiliar or, or, or yeah, it's not a familiar thing to you, you can always reach out to us, MNS or me, myself, for the identification. And then uh, also how much you have fre uh, frequently cited the author. Is it every day or once a week or up to 50 times per year? Yeah, around your, your housing area or the place that you have uh, surveyed. And the information that we want to know is how many authors individual in the group that you have cited. Is it a single author or is it more than 10? Is it a group? Because uh, Harry Nose author uh, has been known to be solitary. Uh, rarely they are come in a group, except they are in family. But for smooth coat author and small coat author, they are mostly large group. But smooth coat author also sometimes uh, single also because they might go and find uh, uh, from their own territory. Eurasian are also set solitary mostly. And how frequent, uh, what is the time that usually uh, you spot the authors? Is it morning or is it noon or is it midnight? So that's, the, that's the, one of the important information that we want to know, to know the active time of author, uh, possibly in different kind of lands, land use, landscape. And what are the uh, activities that the author is doing when you cited them? Are they eating uh, or uh, sprinting, defecating? or just calling or cleaning fur or playing. Yeah. And if you manage to see clearly what kind of food they eat, that would be a tremendous, uh, that would be amazing information also to actually uh, has a, a first-hand information and direct information on what they are eating. So please do provide if you know. Okay, so if you just do a citing information, you can just fill, it, fill up part A to part C. But for part D, it's more on the conflict information, okay? So if you, if you are not experiencing any conflict information, you can actually ignore part D, okay? But if you are in, uh, experiencing conflict information, so we would like to know uh, when is your conflict, uh, when, when you experience your conflict, what is the time and duration? So what is the part of conflict? So we have uh, five examples. The first example is uh, the, actually, the, the author actually destroyed the fishing net or traps. Uh, second is actually they go into aquaculture farm. So I've been talked to some aquaculture farm people. Uh, yes, actually otter has been perceived as a pest to them. Um, uh, but they say it's not a frequent for otter to come into the farm because they say it's, it's, it's rare to see otter anymore. Um, but they, when they come, they say they come in a very, very large group, uh, up to 30 individuals. And, 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 and the, then the more annoying part for them is the author doesn't eat all the fish or the prawn or the crab inside. So the author only eat a part of it while the remaining part, they only kill it and dump it on the floor. So that's the annoying part for the, for the, for the fish farmer. And because this is a, this is a very serious uh, loss uh, of that and damage in terms of uh, in terms of uh, revenue for them, but they have they have not go to the extent of uh, killing author or actually poisoning author. Uh, they in fact they actually have a dog to actually guard the farm, and also have people to guard. Uh, and they also uh, set up electric fence. So far, they don't see they don't see any authors die of electric fences, but this is the result only from my survey. Uh, but in social media, we have, we have evidence of actually author being killed 
by poison uh, the smooth coated otter in, in actually aquaculture farm. And there are recent news also surfaced that actually otter has been a pest and fish farmer has, uh, has filed complaints uh, about otter actually coming into their farm. So I think in Pelitam, we have a lot of information about this, yeah. So uh, the third, the third uh, conflict is actually the herd, the, the herd people. So one of the fish, one of the fish farmer also told us that one of the worker actually got bite from the otter when they tried to catch it. Uh, yeah. So this is one of the things that the, we have taken note about. And then number four is the root kill, uh, root kill, and, and number fifth is the they are causing a nuisance in urban and housing areas. So yeah, so if you, but if you think that you have other conflict, uh, you can actually state here. And then uh, you can actually tell us what, where is the location and what kind of habitat, what of the species, if you can identify and how many of them. And uh, this is not a must, but if you can give us like what kind of losses and roughly how much uh, the cost of loss that you have, uh, that you've got from the auto human conflict. And also what are the activities uh, the respondent do when, when they actually uh, face this auto human conflict? Are they fishing? Are they harvesting in plantation or mangrove? Or in the aquaculture farm? Or they are just wandering around the area? But if you can, if you can state, if you have other activities, and we want to know so whether the group has a pub or not, yeah. And what is the response of the otters towards the respondents? Are they running away, or otters are curious? Otters are curious animal, so they might get they might get nearer and then they run away, or they actually get nearer and try to actually uh go to the extent of actually try to chase you or hurt the respondent, or actually they're not affected by at all. They just uh continue to do their activities and roam around. And how about the respondent? Uh, towards this conflict, the respondent do they run away, or they actually get nearer, but not 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 causing disturbance to the otter, or they actually chase the otter away, or they actually uh, catch it and hit the otter, yeah. And what is the outcome of the conflict? Of course, uh, for obviously for aquaculture farms, the losses of products, uh, but if not aquaculture farm. And what are the other outcomes? Is it uh, injuries that you got or your companion? Or the auto injured during the encounter? Or the worst is the auto kill? So the last two questions is more like we're asking opinion on how we actually to get, uh, together we can mitigate this, uh, this, this auto human conflict because auto human conflict is not uh, documented extensively or comprehensively, like how uh, we document elephant conflict or wild boar conflict. Um, yeah, we tend to actually not really look into smaller, smaller animals conflict. So what we you suggest? Do you think that we should do a live traps or actually a litter traps? Or fencing would be good enough for you? Or like the aquaculture farm, uh, we pet the dog? Or hit or shoot our daughter or poison daughter? But if you think that you have other opinion, please let me know. Or you think that otters is fine. They are belongs to the habitat. We shouldn't disturb them. We should let them. Yeah, but you can also state your own opinion. And the last question is, um, which method has been used is effective and not effective and why? Uh, because if effective, then we could look into actually, uh, 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 we could look into uh, apply it to the whole Malaysia and see what is the way, the best way to actually uh, mitigate this conflict. Okay, so this is the, this is the form that we have uh, produced. So uh, there are still a lot of improvement that we want to do for this form, but for now, we keep it as it is, and we will, we will, we will send it through email and, and to the, all the MNS member, and possibly also upload in the website, MNS website, so that public, anyone can download and, uh, and you can uh, put in your information and give it back to us anytime uh, at your own convenience. And there are, there are more things that we want to do for this kind of uh, uh, collecting information, but that one will keep for the future. So this is a baby step that we take forward. So yeah, so this is what we can do for the time being. 
And now I go back to my presentation slide. So, so that's all for both presentation from my side. Can you all see my screen? Sorry. Hi, Yong. We are yeah. seeing your slide with the word workshop. Okay, good. Okay, great. Okay, so take home message. Uh, yeah, small animals, life matter too. So uh, quite often, especially in Southeast Asia, uh, most of our efforts actually put into larger size animals, um, which is something that more people know and more appear to the people. But we tend to, uh, we tend to have the mindset of we protecting the large animal, we kind of protecting the smaller size animal. But that, that sometimes doesn't actually, uh, uh, that sometimes doesn't work, sometimes doesn't work uh, because we have macro habitat, we have micro habitat as well. So not, not to take granted of the small animal's life, like the hairy nose is the rarest otter species in the world. Uh, it's, it's having a global attention uh, and, and the least known otter species. So having hairy nose in Malaysia still existing is a, is a good news, but how many of them is a question and we don't really know. And it's a difficult question to answer as well. But yeah, we don't really know how much well they do or they actually just like our tiger. So, and we need everyone. So the form created is for everyone to contribute. So conservation is just not a conservation organization or government authorities can, can, can do. Anyone can do, citizen science, science can do. I think most of the most of the audiences are public and corporate, like MSIG. Uh, so it's, it's, it's we need corporate we need corporate side we need um, public to be be us together. And last, we have to ask ourselves how proud are we on Malaysia being the rank twelve in the world mega mega diverse countries. So all these animal, all this biodiversity and plants that make up Malaysia to rank twelve in the world mega diverse countries. So uh, how proud we are determine how, 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 how much extent that we want to protect it. So yeah, so at last, I would like to thank you, express my thank you again to MSIG Holdings as our prime donor, and also Conservation International Asia Pacific as our prime country, and Department of Wildlife and National Park Peninsula Malaysia. They have been very supportive, uh, especially Dr. Bazil. Uh, unfortunately, he's, uh, didn't, uh, he, he's not able to attend this um, uh, workshop. So he's part of a more member and he's, uh, he's one of the pioneer uh, author, author research in Malaysia also with Prof Shuko and also uh, uh, Dr. Hiroshi Sasaki is inside here. So they, uh, they actually pioneer uh, author research. And also KSMP, I would like to uh, express thank you to KSMP uh, for, the, for the support in terms of accommodation and also uh, manpower and local people who continue to become our eyes and ears. Yeah, and so feel free to contact us. Uh, this is my email and contact. Any regard, any things regarding author, uh, author matters. And thank you for your time and learning about authors. I hope everyone learned something uh, from this workshop and, and able to contribute and spread the word. We need more people and good day everyone and have an orderly days ahead like the authors in this group. So they are sleeping very comfort comfortably. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, uh, Wu Chiong. Uh, very good presentation. Thank, congratulations for your hard work. We need more people. We need more people. Back 1980s, late 80s, I've been working with author. Uh, at that time, uh, my focus was still looking at the, what type of uh, food, uh, the main diet, looking for the main diet and the relationship between the contaminated food and the health. Uh, but after that, it's not, not finished. Uh, I'm, I hope that many young generation will uh, continue the work. Now I got uh, Wu Chiyong. Uh, I think, I hope he will continue this because never end. A lot, a lot of things that you need to do with uh, author uh, and many other wildlife. Um, thank you for the participant for many questions that maybe uh, cannot entertain all. Uh, I propose, Tiong, uh, eh, we have to have one uh, 
at the at the we have a website on author but at the same time we have to put one page at the mns main website so that people can respond uh, you can link to your website also mon um, respond to what they see uh, uh, where they see the authors what type pictures and so on because uh, we are looking at more public involvement in this say for example we have been talking about roadkill we're uh, talking about uh, public response to uh, to authors disturbing their fish farm uh, prawn farm and so on so this is a uh, uh, public involvement are needed. And then when we talk about conservation, it's not from Perlitan, it's not from uh, MNS, but, but uh, from all. Yes? MNS is just a media to promote uh, people at all level to support uh, MNS, uh, whatever conservation, uh, wildlife conservation, habitat conservation. Uh, as you know, we have many activities. Chi uh, Wong mentioned just now, he started um, his uh, interest in author after doing this uh, what, uh, postal bird observation. Every year we have AWC, uh, ASEAN Water Bird Census. Uh, for last 10, more than 10 years, uh, we recruit people, we bring people together. And from there, we develop many uh, interest group, uh, SIG special interest group, uh, like author group. So this is a, uh, the beauty of MNS, uh, and if you are strong, let the, you form your own group, or your specialist group. Uh, of course, MNS will support all those uh, activities, and um, uh, we want the aim of our uh, our activities is to make sure all wildlife are well protected, well conserved, and then the habitat are well managed. So, how to do it? We must bring people together. But we Chiong, uh, Chiong doing it now in uh, Selangor Coast is to educate all people there uh, uh, to, to, to support the uh, author conservation. And then um, with our finding on the Erinos uh, author is something that interesting that we need to highlight uh, that how uh, this uh, rare animal need to be protected. People don't know this. We need to highlight more. So website is play a role so that we can get uh, more information on roadkill or not just otter and other animals. So, uh, so we can see how uh, the habitat stress, uh, the public uh, behavior towards animal and, and many things, right? So this is, uh, if you see some uh, comment just now, uh, they suggest to put, uh, to create a tunnel uh, for otter to cross. Um, sometimes in our country, we don't think about that. When we see animal, we are driving. I always say 20 over, 30 over years ago, uh, there are three people in the car. One will say that the animal, one will say, where is it? And the third one say, just hit it. So the, the conservation is still low. Uh, spirit of conservation still low at that time. But now the awareness is there, but we need more action. Right? So I hope by creating a good website, then we will uh, get more information from the public and then we will work together for this uh, 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 conservation program. So people are keep leaving now because uh, nearly uh, 11.30, uh, I think, should we continue or we close here? We, which we, uh, I think I think we can continue. We so, can close yeah. Here. Yeah. so we expected uh, actually one more participant from uh, industries who involved with uh, wildlife or uh, involved with oil palm. Uh, maybe they can help us in terms of uh, authors. Actually, you don't have to speak specific for authors. What, uh, Rani talk on on rules and regulation is good in general because if you save other wildlife, you will save water too. If we protect a riparian a buffer zone, for example, we will protect water and other wildlife too. So this is uh, something that uh, we need to look. There are many private sectors is coming in to, to support. Actually, uh, since last 10 years, I'm involved with MNS directly. 
I found many uh, companies, uh, especially small companies, eh, they, they like wildlife, they like the protection, they like nature, but they don't know how to contribute. So that's why MNS is very lucky. We got a small, small grant uh, to, uh, on special project. Uh, I don't have to mention all the companies, but what we see today, uh, MSIG is one of the company that can support, say they choose author. You can be champion in authors if, if you like. You can choose any animal because no uh, specific company that sponsor all out. Uh, even Maybank, their logo is tiger. Uh, they don't really 100% support uh, tigers. Uh, many agencies are supporting together with Maybank, for example, on conservation and protection of tigers. The same thing with authors. You know, we, we uh, MSIG maybe can champion in this. Uh, Coastal Selangor can be uh, as a site that we are highlighting this, uh, not because just author, but the main thing is they are at the important flyway from uh, East Asian fly, uh, East Asian uh, Australia flyway, which is uh, one of the important stopover birds flying south and north during uh, their migration. Uh, West Coast West, uh, uh, Os Slango, Coastal Slango is very, very important to protect and conserve. So we need more people to come forward together with MNS. And Malaysia has signed the agreement partnership with uh, EFP uh, in 2012. Uh, and part of our commitment is to protect uh, this uh, EFP. East Asian uh, flyway or these flyways, all the stopover identified, for example, from Timataso down south to uh, uh, Telo Air Tower and then Kuala Gula, uh, then down to all Selangor coastline, Johor Tanyung Pi. So, this is the area that we need to protect as our commitment uh, uh, in our EFFP. Uh, that is in Peninsula. Same thing in uh, Sabah and Sarawak. Recently, we discussed under the head of uh, Heart of Borneo program. Uh, we touched a bit about the importance of uh, uh, migratory birds, where coastal area and wetland are very important. So, uh, please, uh, all I welcome all the private sectors to support. There are many things. Number one, just do a small thing education program. You can do research, you can do promotion, you can have a one small short video, and many other things you are welcome to discuss with MNS to do this. Uh, another important thing that I uh, come across uh, the response from the uh, members, the participants, is Ramsar side. Um, of course, uh, MNS are pushing for Ramsar side. Kuala Gula have been. Uh, Planned for a long time ago, uh, but we still cannot get it. Uh, Kuala Selong Nature Park is in the process. Uh, we need a support from state government. If today we got 100 of our participants, uh, if everybody can say something about why we need uh, Kuala Selong Nature Park or that area become a Ramsar site, is very good for state government to listen. Uh, because now it's a minimum with new media uh, government uh, are listening and they have to be. Uh, responsible for some uh, issues and Kuala uh, Gula and another another is potential is uh, uh, Tawa. So recently minister made a statement on the seven sites. This is the old site of Ramsar site and they forgotten to mention about what are the potential new uh, new sites for Ramsar site. We need more and we need more Ramsar site. Uh, and then we need to explain what is Ramsar site to the public because many assume that when we make it Ramsar site and then the local uh, people don't get access to it and then the, the coastal fishermen uh, cannot get fish for example. Actually, it's the other way around. They get more benefit than what if, if the, the area is not Ramsar site. But how we manage it, how we um, promote it, this is very important. So MNS is play role in this. I hope we get full support from the members. Uh, we have nearly 3,000 members. We have nearly 500 schools as a member. We have 14 branches. If everybody says same word, then the government will listen because MNS is a big society. It's an older society. And we have 
wide range of uh, members from professional scientists, uh, researchers, and, and, and many, and many, many people. So I hope uh, by having this uh, uh, workshop, uh, I think all the members should uh, respond to this and continue. Thanks to your support, thanks to the uh, sponsors, and then uh, we welcome more sponsors. Uh, thanks to the Secretariat, uh, Wu Chiang. Please keep continuing this. Don't stop here, and I will support this. And I want it to be uh, to make MON Malaysian uh, Auto Network uh, become bigger, more members. Uh, and then we can say something to the government and then we support the world actually the who demand for nature conservation and they talk about climate change, global warming and biodiversity. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you all. Hope to see you again in the future. Back to you, Chiong. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, there's a lot of questions, so I try to answer as much as possible. But if you have questions that I'm unable to answer or I have missed out, because this chat is very long, so you can feel free to contact me. Uh, I will share the recording uh, together with my slide afterwards so you can get my contacts from there. Uh, so uh, lastly, actually, before we head off, uh, can we do, so we would like to take a group photo. So my colleague, Eileen, will help to take photo. Uh, so I uh, appreciate if everyone can open your video. Yeah, so that we can see everyone's face. And, and my colleague, which the name is Malaysian Nature Society, uh, she will be taking all the photos from everyone. She will be go from, from, from box to box. So it might take a few seconds. So just please smile for a few seconds. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if Eileen is good to go, then yeah. Okay, Eileen, say hold on. Okay. Eileen, oh, still hold on. I think because still of we on, have, okay. yeah, because we have hundred yeah, participants. Glasses, so. Okay, everybody quiet. Uh, just a moment. Uh, Eric, say video disable. <laughs> I think we have a lot of participants, that's why. <laughs> Are you still taking healing? Oh, still hold on, okay. Which one? There are many frames. Thank you all. I have done uh, all the snapshot. So um, hopefully you enjoyed the talk today. And uh, back to Yong. All right. Uh, so I have nothing much. So uh, stay safe. And yeah, Chinese, Chinese New Year is coming. So I think uh, MNS and myself here would like to wish everyone happy Chinese New Year. And stay safe and eat well. Yeah. So I think that's all from everyone. Thank you for coming to the workshop. We will have okay. more Only exciting. Chai, stay safe. Yeah, we will have more exciting auto activities yeah. coming up. So stay tuned to MNS. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good, thanks, bye. Thanks, thanks.